Okay, thank you for joining us today for the Core Insights uh, Digital Transformation Podcast. Thank okay. you for taking the time. Ash, thank you. Great to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have a very strong opinion about uh, <laughs> disruption, disruptive innovation, digital transformation, and how to do it and how not to do it. Mm -hmm. And you define incumbents versus challenger mm -hmm. from an innovation disruption perspective. Yeah. Um, what, what's your thoughts behind, why do you call them incumbents? Mm -hmm. And why do you call some companies like Amazon and Google challengers? Yeah. Is it something that is inevitable that they're going to be dethroned mm -hmm. or something like that? Enlighten us. Yeah, so I, I kind of coined the phrase, Ash, the incumbent nightmare. So I've kind of characterized that incumbents uh, actually are in a very difficult situation because many in many industries, mining, oil and gas, you look at those industries, and the table's been unfairly set because A, I think structurally and culturally, they find it very difficult to do the kind of innovation in the disruptive areas that they need to, and we can talk about all the reasons behind that, but I think there's, uh, you know, they find it hard to replicate in terms of minimal viable products, speed and agility. But I think more importantly is their shareholders. So their shareholders are very intolerant of risk. These are often dividend yield stocks, whereas you know, the larger companies like an Amazon, their shareholders expect billions of dollars to be invested in high risk projects, and they're looking not for dividends, they're looking for equity growth. So a lot of the time, the incumbent companies are stuck in this world where they find it really, really hard to put a lot of money to work in high risk areas where there's not high certainty. And it really makes it, and it doesn't matter what industry you look to, there's a lot of struggling going on as a result of that. That's a great point that the, the investors and the market, they do not incentivize the mm. incumbent companies or the traditional brick yes. and mortar companies to um, allocate those funds, the, yes. the cash flow, yeah. uh, away from the dividends mm. uh, to some sort of transformation or disruptive innovation exactly. that have no guarantee of any returns, right? Exactly. They incentivize how much a dividend you have been able to afford yeah. this year, how many shares you have been able to buy back from exactly. the market. Yep. But my question to you, that yes, there <coughs> is an, a difference in treatment by the market mm. for a Walmart and an Amazon. Correct. Does it really matter? That's an interesting question. I, I don't think it actually does matter at the end of the day because, um, because uh, to my view, is that's the way the market is. Uh, I think it does matter in the sense that if I'm an incumbent company, I have to figure out this innovation thing. Okay, so, and how do I do disruption? So it matters to the extent that I'm not going to change my shareholder base. Okay, so how do I do innovation within the constraints that I have as a business? And I think leadership and CEOs, the really smart ones, will figure this out. And I think there are ways to do it. Because you, know, you, never, you don't have to always invest millions in disruptive innovation. That's not what you have to do all the time. Correct, so, I yeah. think that's a great point. Yeah. So if you could enlighten, and uh, how would you define success in a conventional business, like a brick and mortar business? Mm -hmm. Would that be a quarter, quarter profits, a shareholder value, how much money I've been able to give my investors mm -hmm. on each in stock, like on EPS basis. Mm. And if I am able to generate those returns mm -hmm. every quarter, mm -hmm. why should I be worried about what Amazon is doing, what Google is doing? Yeah, so it's not so much being worried about what Amazon does. So I think, you know, let's take the mining industry as an example. So if I'm an incumbent, I think well, if any industry really is, I have to optim, and we use the ship castle metaphor. So the castle is my core business. And I've got to optimize that, make that as profitable as possible. But at the same time, I've got to uh, develop the other muscle and I've got to become amnidextrous and be good at this innovation, this exploration uh, to create new revenue and growth opportunities for me. So, you know, in a retail sense, it's how do I develop and grow my digital business and digital capabilities whilst optimizing my physical f footprint at the same time. So I think companies really struggle at getting that, getting, becoming amnidextrous. And I don't think there's an option. You have to be good at both. Um, and I, I do it only because it's not I have to obsess about Amazon. I think you just have to do that as a business. You know, in mining, it's around, you know, I've got energy and water problems. In retail, I've got the threat from digital. So you just go through every single industry, there, is a, there are structural challenges and opportunities. And risks. And risks as a result of that, yes. Got it. So uh, as of now, it looks like that everything is in control, but it won't be. Correct. Things are changing around us, new business models are emerging. Yes. And if not, if nothing, we have to be prepared for that. Correct. Got and it. often your very success in your core business becomes your weakness. Yeah. Because people think, well, I'm doing so well, I don't need to change. I yeah. don't need to do any of this. Yeah. I'm just going fine. Yeah. And not to harp on the Kodak example, but that's what I call the Kodak moment. Correct. Because you're just comfortable. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. So c coming back to the point that 
the, the core industries, they find it hard to deploy disruptive technologies yes. to innovate themselves, mm -hmm. kind of disrupt themselves. Um, <clears throat> and if for a moment, if we accept that, mm. okay, it's hard for them to disrupt. Yep. It's something that they should quit trying and just wait and watch and use it as a second mover advantage. Yes. Let someone boil the ocean. Yep. Let someone extract yes. the value. Let someone turn the whole thing into mm -hmm. economy of scale. Yep. And once it's ready, I'll just acquire it. Yes. So what's wrong with that? But that, that has been seen as a valid strategy, but I think uh, there was a, the former CEO of Gold Corp, Chuck Jeans, actually at a conference with Bank of Montreal said something. He said, for a long time, I was, had the fast follower mentality. Let somebody else do it, and then I'll pick it up and you know, buy it through purchasing function, and I'll be fine. And he said, what I realized was that actually a fast follower was really actually me saying, I'll do nothing. And he said, and I realized that's not an option, because I actually never fast followed anything. And, and then, then the other question my people used to ask me, if, well, if we're a fast follower, who's the leader? Okay, so these were kind of two paradigms that came out from that. So. And I think if you look at any industry, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about, oh, I have to be innovative. What are the challenges that I have? And does that require transformation in the industry? And you go through each industry, and, and, and I think most industries just have enormous challenges that require pretty transformative innovation to occur. Otherwise, I just don't see how these companies, not that they'll go out of business, but will they remain valuable in the eyes of the market? So. I think that, that's a great point, that yeah. if you do not have one commonly accepted an established leader. Yes. Who are you following? Who are you following? You yeah. will end up following nothing. Exactly. You will keep on yeah. going, digging dirt. Yes. From the earth and yeah, right. Yeah. It yes. will be business as usual. Business as usual. Yep. So, if if we can just split the disruptive innovation. Yep. And agility and speed of execution. Yes. If we just could split yes. these two, we understood that disruptive innovation or Innovation per se is, is difficult for the mining companies or other companies. Yep. Why can't they adopt something in which they already see a lot of companies are leader and they just try to change their own working and be more agile, more, mm. more you know, faster yeah. in terms of you know, change and, and way of working? Yeah, it's, it, that's an interesting point. So I, I think there's, sources, there's, probably, there's multiple sources of innovation or you know, capability. So I think, you know, let's take mining as an example since we're on it, but you know, for mining you could, there are I think technologies that are in other industries that can be adapted and adopted, okay? So that's kind of, I think, the low hanging fruit, right? Uh, but there are things that are very specific that may or may not be competitive advantage for a single company that they have no choice, they've got to. And it's more about accelerating the innovation, the pace of innovation and the ecosystem around them to address that. So yeah, one big specific example, I mean, as you know, is that they, the industry is facing, they've got to reduce the amount of water and energy it takes to produce a unit of commodity. Uh, and because of the declining grades, I mean, this is an urgent problem for the industry because if you follow the trend for the next 10 years, it's unaffordable to continue to mine the way they are. You can't consume as much water and energy as they do uh, with the declining grades. So that something has to change. And the, kind of the linear progress and, and incremental innovation is not going to get them there. That's right. It's just not going to work. Yeah, like so. the the, the old, <coughs> old grades are declining, distances yes. are increasing. Yep. The mines are getting deeper yes. and deeper. And deeper. Yep. And the, the mineral is getting harder yes. to, to grind and more yeah. energy is required. Yeah. At the same time, th there is a pressure to reduce the energy. So th th these, these forces can never be balanced. They can't be balanced, yeah. And that's complicated now. You were just, yeah, on the non-profit side, we were just doing some work with the Rockefeller Foundation and a bunch of people across the value chain. And the, in the last 18 months, and I think it's going to get even worse in the next 18 months, is the pressure to reduce it, to really start addressing emissions in the industry uh, is becoming very intense. So, you know, so, you know, there's a lot of diesel being consumed on the mobile fleet and for electricity generation in mines, and then a lot of the grid they use is, you know, coal-based. Is I think the industry is going to come in under increasing pressure, not only to lower my energy intensity, but also to move to a much cleaner energy footprint. And that's I, going to require some pretty radical transformation. I, I, I have a strong opinion on that, yeah. which might be a little bit, you know, uh, debatable or arguable sure. uh, thing, but I believe that mining plays a defensive role unnecessarily. Yes. 
Okay. Like it's not that bad in industry mm. that it takes blame for. Yep. Mining is always labeled as uh, like a, a driver of environment change and climate change mm -hmm. or unsafe operations. Yeah. But if you look at the statistics, yeah. the injury rate in athlete, athletics or sports is more than mining. Sure. And uh, we can't live without mining. Yeah. If I, I saw that in the IMARC mm. conference, there was huge protest. That mm. was unprecedented, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and they were like mm. protesting that mm. stock coal mining. Mm. But I see that those people are misled. Yeah. And they should be protesting in front of a coal-fired power plant, mm -hmm. not the coal mining operation. No. Coal mining, yeah. just like any other mining yeah. activity, doesn't yeah. generate extra. I don't disagree with you. I think you know, mining's a necessary activity. We get that. You know, with electrification, it's even more of a necessary activity. Three, though, mining faces some really big headwinds. And one of those is, you know, and it's kind of the dichotomy. There's the same people that are asking for electrification of everything and generally anti-mining. So it's kind of like, hold on, you need more mining to electrify, not less. So, but I think we're facing more activism in the West to stop mining, which is ill-informed. I think we're facing more activism from communities and indigenous people. But that's not ill-informed. That's because they're not seeing the benefits of mining in and around them. At the same time, their governments want to develop the very resources that communities want to stop. So I think the mining industry, along with government, needs to figure out how to do that better. And I think that's a huge amount of innovation opportunity from business model, technology, et cetera, can help there. So you're right, we need it and we need to figure this out. And you know, mining as a brand, really, it is on the defensive. And I often tell the industry, you can't market your way out of this because you have no credibility, like many industries. So somehow they have to present it in a way where, and start demonstrating through actions that you know, this is not a, you know, we're doing the best we can, we have a better vision for what, what we can do. So yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. It's very complicated. Yeah. I, I digress. No, uh, yes, yeah. Let's come back. That's a whole interview all by itself, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yep. This is a whole new, new topic. It's huge. Uh, so th this is all about digital transformation. No, let's no, stay, stay yeah, to that. We'll get back on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, in mining, mm. we don't have a threat like Amazon or Google. No, we don't. There is no company that is trying to disrupt their the way of working or, mm -hmm. or business model. They mm -hmm. are not bringing in new technology that will completely you know, uh, mm -hmm. remove the process itself. Mm -hmm. There are better efficiencies, there are worse efficiencies, that's mm -hmm. it. What is the challenge that you see in mining? Well, actually, I kind of think, uh, I think of it, so there's a nuance in there. So I think that the, tr the, the issues that the mining industry is facing, the traditional miners as we know them today, I think they have big challenges they have to sort out because there are a set of challenges, I think. And those challenges to me are the vertically integrated companies that are currently investors in mine, so Sumitomo, Mitsui, Mitsubishi, and companies like that, uh, are all taking, in my view, a much more increasing interest beyond being just an investor in how mining is done. So because if mining can't address this unit cost of production, energy, et cetera, et cetera, and the social environmental issues surrounding mining at the community level, I believe, this is my theory, that in the next 10 years, companies like those will start entering mining themselves because they're not satisfied with how the industry is responding to these challenges. And therefore, uh, the materials I'm getting are not being sourced in a responsibly enough manner. So responsible sourcing, I think, is going to be one of these big drivers for transformation. And if the incumbents can't address them in a timely manner, there will be new entrants into the market. <coughs> and also I think, you know, uh, technologies, and we know about these, like swarm mining, I call it the industry's fracking moment, it'll happen. I, I, so I, I don't think the industry can sit back and be comfortable and cosy and say, nobody else is going to do mining in the next 10 years, we're fine, we just need to incrementally improve our business and we're going to be okay. I, I just think that's a falsehood. And the only caveat to that is, you know, there's certain mining companies, they like, I call them the Saudi Aramco's of mining, because they're sitting on top of such embarrassingly low cost production. And that's you know, BHP and Rio with their iron ore assets and you know, Vale and a couple of others, but that's a minority of the industry. And then the rest of the industry uh, face, and the other commodities face huge issues. I mean, copper's a huge issue. The waste, what, what Rio may call waste, it's an ore for some other company. For somebody else, exactly, yes. So, yeah. so I think they've got to, I, I, they have to address this. So yes, it's not an Amazon, but I think there are threats nevertheless. Got it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and I think you, you touched upon this a little bit in the beginning, is that because mining is an asset in incentive intensive yeah. and capital intensive, high yeah. cost operation. Yeah. And 
provided that they don't they have very limited mm. control on pricing yeah. except for few big companies yes. that can actually make the market yeah. rather than take the market um, the b class companies are not not rios or bhps they have price takers yes so all they can control is the cost yeah cost of operation yep. and it comes down to productivity yeah. reliability Correct. performance so would you agree or do you have any different thoughts that when it comes to disruption or disruptive innovation mm. or digital transformation whatever you call it mm. um, does it all come down to how can i be more agile how can i be a cost leader yeah. within my so sector interesting. Yeah. so i think digital transformation uh, can express itself in different areas within the mining value chain so i think the first area is obviously how can i use digital technology ai machine learning etc to continue to reduce the cost of production and so there you get into you know predictive analytics around your know, maintenance increasing productivity of fleet fleet optimization so that's one area um, and depending where you are on the cost curve the size of that opportunity will vary right if you're low on the cost curve small opportunity if you're high big opportunity another area where i think is kind of the the flip side uh, which is in resource characterization so money companies aren't really that good at knowing their resource so if i can use technology and again an ai machine learning can play a real powerful role in this but also how you capture that knowledge is if you can increase the resource characterization awareness if you like and fidelity earlier in the cycle and increase recovery rates i mean the value the accretive value to a company is off the charts off the charts so i think that's an area that some companies are starting to explore because there's only so much you can capture in the cost reduction so that's another big area for digital transformation and i think the third area and you know bhp's talked about this publicly is value chain automation i think you guys are doing something with one mining company which is really how do i go if you like from mine to market and if i can kind of make that a real time data stream with intelligence then combined with some of the other things we've talked about so if you get a market signal that says i need this grade of ore today because it's got a better price and i can actually change what i mine for the next 3 days to respond to that market signal that's really powerful that's very powerful and that digital platform and that's an area where i mean nobody in the mining industry is doing that and nobody's doing and it whole, and a lot of industries aren't doing very it very so, few but, people are even thinking about it yeah so um, i think that's a very very powerful opportunity. so that's if you like to so got three buckets of digital transformation that i think no that that's focused point. on yeah yeah and if you see it from from a maturity perspective mm. you can't start from that point no right you, you have to start small yeah build that coalition yes of forces and you, where you have uh like a, a magical moment where yeah. you know that oh i i understand technology i understand data yeah. my my people are aligned towards yeah. it now let me throw more diverse challenges more complicated challenges yes. and let's see if they solve it yeah you you throw them a big challenge and yeah. they fail and then you're done exactly so i think mining companies i mean there's one has created an opportunity so me and you've read my papers you know is you know mining has been a persistent under investor in innovation you're very low lower than construction even so but at the same time because of that they have an opportunity now to leapfrog because i think you know a lot of digital technology because they've been playing a lot with it in the last 5 years it's become so mature uh in advance that there's an opportunity to kind of leapfrog for the mining industry so that's one the other limitation which i think they're starting to address is they need to stimulate the startup ecosystem so you know venture capital and corporate venture capital really hasn't been that available in uh mining so you have a lot of stranded technology and research or stuck in small companies you know and if you have a fundamental belief a lot of innovation particularly in digital is actually the is going to occur in smaller companies you know startups post revenue startups you know um then the mining industry needs to learn how to a get more vigorous in investing in those companies to help them grow but also how do you partner and engage with those companies so because i don't think a lot of this is going to be found in their traditional supply base what we're talking about here so you had pretty good points let let us discuss all these points one by one sure so when you think about the investment in mining mm. and uh, you mentioned those facts like um manufacturing spends like 1 to 2% of Correct. their revenue in innovation yeah as against mining which is like 0.2 to 0.2% yes so they have a lot to catch up they have a lot to catch up um i have an opinion just like i have on, on <coughs> almost everything yeah um so manufacturing by design they have to invest a lot in any innovation correct because they they interact with the user of the product yep they are not they are not in a commodity business they are into uh, yeah. a product that has yep. features and that is interacted by people sure and if you fail to to in excite the user mm. they will stop buying your car or yep. any anything any mm. other thing right 
So they have a desire, they have a, yes. a business use case to stay invested in, in, yeah. in uh, innovation. But mining, they don't even see their user. No. They are completely isolated yep. and they just don't, they have to be at the mercy of the market. Whatever price they can get, they will get the price. And they, if there is any downturn, and if downturn comes, manufacturing mm. turn back to the innovation, they go back to the drawing board and see, can I design mm. a faster car? Can I design a more efficient, yeah. something like that. Mining just weathers is out there. Okay, I'm gonna sit for six months and I'll, I'll see what happens. Yes. I'm still sitting on this huge ore body. Yeah. So what do you think that defines or, or kind of justifies that? I think that was a valid viewpoint until today. I think that's no longer a valid viewpoint they can take. I mean, if you're sitting on a low production asset, like say a real BHP is, you know, I'm selling iron ore at 100 bucks and producing it at 10, kind of valid. But I think, what's, I think what we're seeing transforming, and we've done some work around this, is that the companies that are the consumers of metals to make their end product they sell to consumers are under increasing pressure to show that the products they produce are responsibly sourced. And, you know, there's lots of things. Mining won't transform by itself, and you're right, they don't connect to the auto companies. So we know for a fact, and we're talking to several auto companies, that they are increasingly interested in the value chain from steel, aluminium, and all the way back into the mine. And they need to know, I want responsibly source whatever it looks like, metals. So my, that pressure will start coming from those consumer companies. And I think where the mining company is uh, at risk is they don't have those relationships. Yeah. How many mining companies sit in with an auto manufacturer and say, what's bugging you about what we do? I, th I think there's a couple that do, uh, but that, that's a steam train coming around the corner. Uh, and I think that's going to cause a fundamental shift in how mining companies think, or uh, are they, they will have to do that. Correct. So, and I think in, in, uh, it won't be out of context if we try to say Rio Tinto's partnership with Apple. Yep. In, in developing this technology for aluminium. Yeah, aluminium. aluminium. I think that's kind of a signal of what is going to be needed into the future. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great, great, yeah. great point. Um, moving forward, so uh, we briefly discussed about the productivity part. Yeah. The, you, you said that the productivity is something that mining has not yet figured out. Correct. In the last couple of years, while mining has recovered from that downturn yes. and looks like the, the good days are back, the productivity equation is still not solved. Yes. Um, how much of, you, of that unsolved equation, apart from that declining yeah. ore grade and everything, is related to the asset, the equipment and the operations productivity? Yeah, I think there's, uh, I think there's a combination, asset quality, you know, the design of the mine and the equipment and the fact it's all manned. So this kind of w walks you into the area of autonomy, autonomous operations. <coughs> so, and, you know, and if you listen to the auto industry, I mean, actually probably the number one application of AI and machine learning is autonomy, right? You know, because that's the most complex application of AI. So I think mining has a huge opportunity. I think they, people may think automated trucks are exciting, and, but I think that's the thin edge of the wedge. So to get true value chain automation done, you need to have a fully autonomous mine. An autonomous truck is higher operating cost than a manual. Correct. I think an autonomous 300 ton truck's kind of ridiculous. I mean, you're automating something that's not very efficient in the first yeah. place. And I think the new scale is actually small, not large. Exactly. So like, th it so doesn't make sense to have 400 tr ton truck no. riding on an unmanoeuvrable yeah. roads or something. I agree. I would rather have 100 tonners. Agreed. With more flexibility in my track, more flexibility in my bench, yep. and with the safer operation. Exactly. It's more modular, it's yeah. more flexible. So I think that's the future. So I think they're going to get into smaller equipment, right down to swarm mining, right, which is kind of using the ant analogy. And I know for a fact there are, uh, there's a startup technology company, I can't name them, that is actually at the pilot stage of having fully autonomous robots that are no bigger of the, the chair you're sitting in, Ash, doing my underground hmm. mining and processing. Okay, which is really, really exciting. And they're fully electric, obviously. Uh, fully autonomous, orchestrated, because they're working in packs. So I think that whole, I think that's one of the big transformational areas for mining. That is. And it's really exciting to me. And so. that is something that we can call an Amazon for mining. Yes. Like changing or disrupting this. <coughs> totally. Like otherwise, the OEMs, if we leave innovation for the, to the, for the OEMs to do, yeah. I think they have disappointed for 100 years. They have. If you think about what OEMs have innovated, yeah. bigger machines. Yeah. And that's all they can do. Yes. Like we had this small grinding mills, now we have this big grinding yeah. mills, that's all. Yep. I've done my part. Exactly. But that's not innovation. 
There's a lot of innovation. I always liken them to the big equipment guys, to the IBM of old. They're a hardware manufacturer and they've tried to transform into mini computers from mainframes in the old day. And all these areas, they never were able to figure it out yeah. because they were stuck in this big paradigm of big computers and software, digital, smaller, never got it. So, so c coming back to um, disruption and innovation in mining. Yeah. And um, you mentioned that mining is now much more, um, I would say, accepting. Mm. the need for innovation yes. and they are forthcoming yeah. and you don't have to now educate them you they're actually asking for help they are now they're asking how can you help me I'm, I'm trying to do this That's good do you point. have something that they can help me so where do you think they can improve where do you think that they're, they're doing what's right or what they're doing is suboptimal can be improved yeah i think yeah, it's kind of it's interesting i, th I think they need to go faster I think speed is a key issue for them. So, I mean, I think the <coughs> best way to look at it is who are the companies that are leading the pack? So I think Anglo-American to me, amongst the major companies, is a clear leader, you know, with their future smart initiatives and everything they're doing. So they've got some really interesting technologies and capabilities that they're working on. And they've really figured out that innovation path. I think BHP is on the path. Rio Tinto is doing a reset of its innovation. Uh, Tech is a really interesting company and that with Race 21. Uh, they're really starting to do some exciting things. And yeah, they're kind of one of those companies that's big enough to do something meaningful, but small enough to be entrepreneurial. Cadelco in Chile is another one. <coughs> so, but I think everybody needs to move faster. It's not about putting more money at it. It's just because you've got to get out of the mindset, because I'm doing something that's physical, I just need to take a lot of time because I'm building something. I just That's a falsehood. So I think there's a lot of things they can do from a way I approach innovation to be faster. And I think the other one, to help speed up innovation is to, you really got to start leaning into investing in startups. You really do. Uh, and I think the key thing for me is two areas. One is how do I invest in those technologies that are in R&D labs that can never get out, but they're interesting. So there's a lot of collaborative research going on around the world that money companies are funding, but there's no way for them to get into a startup funded and grow. But the other one is how do I encourage, particularly in digital, how do I encourage companies that are doing other industries to start applying their solutions to mining. How do I encourage and stimulate them to do that? Yeah. So, and we worked with one company in the valley, and I can name Safe AI, for example. They're working in construction, and we help stimulate them to think about and doing an autonomy platform for mining. So, as an example, so I think you need to do more of that. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's a great point, uh, mm. and that covers the second point that you spoke before is about uh, how do you access those startups or yes. revenue plus. Startups yep. and use those technology and help them scale. Exactly. Um, one thing that I find that is a self-defeating -de goal, kind of, is mm. that mining companies only invest in those startups if they get an ownership of the IP. Oh yes, that's a. And th that's like, what are you going to do with that IP? Self-defeating. Yep. It's a self-defeating goal. Like it is, you, yeah. you invested a million dollar. Yeah. And then million dollar is just yeah. down the drain. Yeah the moment you think about IP. Yeah, I agree. So I think we've got some, uh, you know, it's kind of the adoption curve, you know, crossing the chasm adoption. So some of the early adopters and visionaries in mining have gone over that hump. We get we can't control IP, but I think the bulk of the industry is still stuck in that world. And they should not. They can't, it's like, not. Like Elon Musk and Tesla, they make every patent public. Yes. They don't keep any innovation to themselves. Yeah. And that's not, uh, I would say, magnanimous approach, that's a selfish approach. Exactly. Because unless there are a lot of superchargers across every gas station, Tesla will not kick off. Correct. You need to democratize Democratized those technology. ideas. You yeah. need to get that adoption yeah. fast yeah. if you have to grow fast. Yeah. If, if Gold Corp tries to invest through their Disrupt 2020 or whatever yeah. they call it, if they keep on investing in, uh, in one startup, two startups, that's a technology that stays there. It, does, it doesn't yeah. see the light of the day. Yeah, we've seen that so often. But I think, you know, I think some money companies are realizing actually it's not only the technology where you get your competitive edge, it's how you apply the technology. Exactly. And the earlier you're in the kitchen helping develop that technology, and then you apply it to your business, that's your advantage. Owning and that's it. where the game begins. Yes. Like, there, there is no guarantee that this technology no. is going to help you. Yeah. Plus, there is a huge problem of adoption, change management, behavior yep. change yeah. that you don't even aware yeah. about because you're too focused on IP. IP, exactly. And I, and I encourage mining CEOs to realize that by owning IP, all you're doing is you're condemning those startups to being forever small and forever small companies with the pace of change can't innovate. So you end up with a technology in three years that's out of date and you wonder why, well, now it's useless. Well, it's because you've constrained those companies. Yeah. So it's kind of this chicken and egg. So.
Uh, I like great point. tech approach that they play in LP. Yes. In Chryslix. In Chryslix, yes. Rather than acquiring a. Yeah. Uh, and Chryslix is because, as you know, I sit on their board and uh, we're very excited as we create and running. We intentionally, because you know, we all only have strategic LPs, so we now have one, two, three, about five mining companies as LPs. So we have Tech, South32, Sylvester, and a couple of others, and F FL Smith on the supply side, and Caterpillar on the supply side, that have all become LPs, all with a focus. You know, Cap's obviously a bit varied, but the rest are all very mining focused. So I think those are kind of indications that what we've just been talking about, some of these companies are getting us. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so coming, coming back to what the mining companies are doing, I, I see yeah. that a lot of mining companies today, they have their in-house teams. Yes. Uh, director of innovation or a whole team. Yep. Innovation, CIOs, CTOs, and uh, they try to either develop solutions themselves or they try to find yep. nice partnerships or they're completely like, hey, I'd, I'm not going to, to reinvent the wheel here. Let me find a good supplier and just done with it. In your experience, mm -hmm. what do you think is the most effective and sustainable approach? Approach for them, interesting question. So I will say it will depend on the problem that they're facing, right? But if we're, fo if we're focusing on the disruptive thing, I, I, you've got to develop, you can't do it on your own, that's, uh, that's just not gonna happen. Um, and I think a more partnership oriented approach is required. So the mining industry is predominantly stuck in a transactional procurement model of approaching companies. So yeah, we're working with companies to kind of re-educate them. This is what a partnership looks like. So I think they've got to partner with companies. But they're not wrong. <coughs> hmm? They're not wrong. No. All their life they have bought, bought machines. Yes. That gave them a feeling yep. of possession mm. and a constant output, a predicted yeah. output. Yep. It's a, it's a new thing to buy a software that yeah. they don't know anything about. Yeah. So we've always said, you know, that, that money companies have to invest in partnerships because they have to signal to companies that aren't otherwise developing solutions for mining that mining is serious, because these companies are not gonna do it by themselves. So with Rio, we encourage that. They kind of got trapped though, and we need to own the IP because we're paying for it. So I think, and then, so they've got past that. Uh, BHP Dasso Systems announced a partnership with BHP that we're involved with called Voyager, where they are co-developing a whole new mine planning platform that BHP won't own. Okay, so that's important. So I think those are kind of some of the models. And Anglo-American are working on some very interesting partnerships as well. So I think it's kind of like we need to partner, we need to help co-fund, okay. Um, or even better is we get to a point where startups will just do it on their own for mining based on the mining company helping them in other ways. Um, so that's a model the oil and gas industry uses quite well. Hmm. So it's all about developing that partnering muscle and being comfortable. I don't own the IP. Other companies will get it, but I'm going to help stimulate those startups or yeah, middle-sized companies to develop solutions. So, Yeah, I, I think uh, w one way to look at the IP equation is I don't want to own the IP as a mining company, mm. but let's do it this way. If, if I don't own the IP, the work that we are doing, nobody else should own it. Yeah. And th that might give them a comfort that yeah. if they are not using it, they are, they are not owning it, their competitor will not be. Yeah, and there's always, and there's so many ways to get advantage, you know, like de you delay a release, I get something and you've got one year, I hold yeah. it for a year, because you can't stop a company marketing something forever. Exactly. Yeah. So there's different, or there's a piece of secret sauce I'm going to hold on to yeah. <coughs> for a bit longer. So, and and yeah. we get these questions all the time. You I can imagine. All the time that, yeah. can I get uptakes data science model mm. and own it? And first, Technically, it's impossible for yeah. us to extract data science models the way our platform is structured. Yeah. Second, what I try to tell people is that it's not data science model that you, you want. Yeah. You want better performance in your operations. Yeah. You want your machines not to fail. Mm. You want better productivity. You want better performance of your yeah. machine. That's the outcome. The conversation should be there. Hey, I want to own better performance. Yes. How can you help me? Yep. If I give you data science model yeah. for a pump, if I am working on 100 different mm -hmm. pumps on different industries, all that learning on that platform mm -hmm. is not available to you. Yeah. Then you are stuck. Yes. Your pump performance after six months will be worse than somebody else's pump Correct. performance because you are just that one data yeah. point. Yep. So th that is something that's, uh, as you rightly said, it's an educational maturity. Yeah, curve. and you go into a great point, Ash, is data ownership. Oof. Yeah. This is a big area. So, you know, obviously, mining companies produce a lot of data themselves, but the, I think there's a I wouldn't say a battle, but there's a back and forth going on with a lot of OEM manufacturers as to who owns the data that the machines are pumping out. 
So again, mining companies will produce a lot of data from the mine itself, independent of machines, but then the machines that are, you know, that they own, but the data platforms in them are from the manufacturers, is who owns the data, who's able to use the data. So I think this mining companies have to learn this, there's a distinction in that. It doesn't matter actually who owns the data, it's how you use the data. So as long as I get to use the data, use the insights and apply it. <coughs> so I think that whole thing's still playing out actually. You still, I yeah. think and it's then you have the uptakes of the world that are also then building platforms to take all this data. So yeah, it's a triangle almost, company, OEM, and the providers. And, and the providers. So I think that that's a, I have an opinion, just like yeah. because, uh, that, that OEM <coughs> should not own the data. I agree. Um, because they, their data ownership is, comes from selfish interests. Yes. Because it's not about that I want to own the data as an OEM, it's that nobody else should look into my data Correct. and tell my user yeah. that your parts consumption can be improved. Yeah. Because my money comes from parts and services, not yes. from the... It, it's itself. the worst of a walled garden. They're making the garden so small yeah. and walling it off. Yeah, I, th I think that's unfair to the mining companies. That's totally. unfair to mining companies. It is totally, yeah. And, and if you look at the <coughs> autonomous trucks, they, they generate a lot of data that is outside of the truck. Yes. They generate data about the, the ramp, Yep. about the slope, yes. about the safety conditions, about other vehicles, yeah. about the speed, and about so many different yes. things that are kind of environmental, situational, right? environmental, yeah, environmental, yeah. that OEMs have no right to claim that. No, because that's the mining data, because that's, that's mining, about the company's data. But that data itself doesn't yeah. go to, to mining companies. No. But I think that's a different conversation. That's another interview, that's right? Another <laughs> interview. <laughs> interview. We've got three more interviews to do. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the right approach, and you touched upon it right. like five minutes back, that Depends on the situation. Depends mm. on what they're trying to solve. Sure. It depends whether they should build it, buy it, or partner. Yep. Uh, let's let's see it this way: that mm. I, uh, a mining company, is trying to build AI mm -hmm. tools, machine learning tools, mm -hmm. and they've got a team to figure it out. How should they come to to an opportunity mm -hmm. that is feasible? Means can be solved with the existing infrastructure, existing mm -hmm. data viable, worthy of their time and attention, that they're not spending their entire time on something that doesn't mean yep. a lot. Mm -hmm. Third, scalable, mm -hmm. that if I'm a multi-site mining company, can I solve it here, mm -hmm. spend six months mm -hmm. developing a solution and then just copy and paste it to all yep. the other sites? Mm -hmm. And finally, can I, can I get all my stakeholders rallying behind it yeah. and say, that's the right problem to solve. Yeah. Once you give me the solution, actually I'm looking forward to it, yeah that will make my life so easy. Yeah. So these four questions, feasible, viable, scalable, and having a rally or support from the right. site, what's the right process of doing it? So I think process, so, and we've worked a lot of this with companies, is you know, we call it fast path, but it's kind of like, first you need to kind of rank all your problems. So you need to have an agreed upon set of, how do you rank one problem over the next? And, you know, and otherwise it just become pet projects. And sometimes you're doing something that's not that valuable versus you're leaving something that's more valuable, maybe a bit harder, but you should be working on that one, not this one. So really having a very systematic approach to identifying problems, ranking those problems and the opportunities, I think is really important. So we call that attractiveness. Why is this solution or problem more attractive to solve than this one? So that has to be very systematically done. Otherwise it's just opinions. And this we get into arguments and you can't sustain investment in projects in that environment. Exactly. So that's really important. So once you've got that laid down, how do you identify the companies that can help you do that? And then again, there's ways to do that. Okay. Um, and then it gets down to, so I fundamentally believe, you know, if you take AI machine learning, this is not a plug for you guys at all, but there is no way, and I don't think it's just mining industry, there is no way individual companies have the capabilities in AI machine learning internally. Just, it's just not feasibly possible because... It's not their core competency. It's not their core competency. The talent is so scarce. And, and the so amount of money it will require. Yeah, and it's moving so fast. I was talking to a CEO of a, era of a you know, space company in Pasadena and he said, in the last five years, I, and this guy's you know, double PhD, is I have even been surprised about the pace of change in AI and machine learning. It's just been staggering to me what we can do now. Um, and that's a, that's a guy that lives in this world, right? In a startup world, in space. So I think it's not your core company, don't even try to go there. So this is my problem. And then you, you've got to find the right partner for you to do that. And I think you've touched on to what I think is the biggest problem in mining, actually. 
So you get all this right and you do the pilot in one mine. Is what mining's been really good at is I pilot something, but it never goes anywhere after that. Is and because every mine's different, that's what they say, and therefore that solution you applied for that mine doesn't apply to my mine. So they they've got to learn how do I take one and then scale it across all my mine sites rapidly to get the value from that. And that's where you kind of get into you know, mining needs to look a bit more like a manufacturing system. So um, so I think there's way, and we've come up with ways that you can do that. So, um, you know, investigate ideas, prototype them, and get ramp, ramp them out. But it's going to take a bit of, you know, kind of a bit more direction from companies. It's the only way they're going to capture the value of this stuff. Otherwise, you're going to have all these isolated solutions, site by site. You know, get, never going to get to this integrated value chain automation if that's the way you operate. So, it, it's, the, it's the holy grail for mining companies. It's the holy grail, exactly. It really is. Like, um, as you rightly said, rank the, the problems. Ultimately, I, I want to reach out to all the problems that I've ranked, yep. but I cannot st start all of them at Can't once. Start all of them, yep. uh, the best way to, to reach, uh, to mm -hmm. do it is solve two problems that are really good, yeah. viable, feasible, and everything, and the savings or extra revenue mm -hmm. from these problems actually fund the investment yeah. for the third problem, yes. and so on and so yeah. forth. So one thing we've been working with mining companies is it's kind of a method of saying, <coughs> if this is the problem you're going to solve and this is the you know, area to s technology you're looking at to solve it, you are making some, s you've got a set of hypotheses and assumptions within that. So before you go s build a solution, test the feasibility of those assumptions and hypotheses through learning plans. So this is kind of bringing in concepts of minimal viable product and lean into the system. So rather than build what you know, figure out what you don't know and figure out and then iterate and learn through that before you get to the final solution. Uh, and that kind of method and thinking is new to them, but we're seeing being adopted because because that's the way. Instead of plowing hundreds and tens of millions of dollars into something, and then find out it's not going to work, is very quickly with low investment, relatively speaking, you can find out yes, this is feasible and viable, and then you can go on and do it. So that whole concept is something that's kind of bleeding into the mining industry now, because many of them are stuck. You know, not too tech most even agile is foreign to a lot of mining companies. So we're saying you need to move from waterfall to agile, but also you, on top of agile is the whole learning plan, iterative, minimal viable process. If you, if you advise them to follow agile, yep. the risk is that they will follow agile, yeah, religiously. but they would not have the mindset of agile. Correct, and we've seen that too. And that's worse. Yep, so there's a lot of coaching. Waterfall is that. much better than, than following agile without agile mindset. Yes, no, you're right. And then wrapping the whole minimal viable learning plan process because that's what you apply agile to. You need the mindset. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> like understanding that this is not final, but I'm I'm looking at it and yes. I I'm contributing and making yeah. it better. And that, right. yep. that that's a nice segue to my next question about mm -hmm. when you think about minimum viable product for any innovation project, any AI, or what kind of project. Um, I think that today, no one one team, no one company. No one person can mm. do it alone. No. Be it any company, mm. they are super smart in AI. They know how to write data science models and everything. They ultimately need user. Correct. And they not Correct. only just need user to use the product, but yeah. provide constant feedback mm. that becomes a close yep. loop for machine learning, getting their algorithms smarter. Yep. And it requires a two-way. It does. Co collaboration. Yep. Tell me something about where are we in the industry in terms of understanding that I am no longer placing a purchase order for a machine where after I acquire this machine, my relationship is over. Right. Against this, I need to have a different mindset is that mm -hmm. I'm starting a project, right. I'm starting a relationship, yes. a partnership, yep. which will not give me a result in six months when the mm -hmm. pilot is over. Yeah but the results are going to show up in 12 months and 18 months and okay. 24 months. So I've got th three examples where that's actually working in the industry. So I kind of think, again, we're in the early adopter phase of people getting this. So I think tech's relationship with Mindsense is an, a true partnership where, and so Mindsense is a portfolio company at Chryslix, uh, very, very interesting company. Uh, and they've entered a partnership where Mindsets is the technology expert with some knowledge of mining and tech's bringing all its smarts into of they mining have and sense machines. and shovel sense. Yes, and so that's a partnership that's working. And now Mindsets is going to start scaling beyond the initial mine site. So I think that shows where 
It's a true partnership, it's not procurement. My, the, my, tech gets it's got to provide expertise, equipment expertise, etc. to mine sense. So that's working. I think Anglo's got several examples of where that's happening with, again, early stage companies where I'm providing them all the expertise. So what the mining company does is I provide expertise, I provide access to a mine, because it's pretty hard to get otherwise if you're not a miner, <coughs> equipment, etc. to help get you along. But at the end of the day, it's your solution, your product, I'm going to be the beneficiary of that. And I think BHP is an example as well. So, so I think we're starting to see companies get this, but I think there's a lot of work to be done still, and you know, how part, you know, making that a much smoother process. But I, I'm glad to see it's starting because I, I think these companies get they haven't got all day. You know, these pressures are real. So I mean, you look at um, you know the big um, you know copper mine in Chile. I mean, you, you project out with BHP what they said. You know, in, f in ten years, you know, the grade is going to the grade used to be two and a half percent. Okay, 10, 15 years ago, it's now down to kind of one, just under one, and in 10 years it's going to be below half of 1%. If you do the calculation of how much dirt, and if you just keep doing it the way you're doing, the dirt and water and energy you have to do, it's just, it's unfeasible. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so urgent <laughs> to innovate, so. No, that's right, that, that, that's true. Uh, one last theme, sure. yep. and I'll let you go after that. We'll earn our beer, right? Uh, and then we will have beer. Um, in terms of change management. Yes. I think it's, it's a big, big piece. Yes. And uh, there is a lot of hype around it. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how much of that hype is real, how much that is fabricated. Mm. Um, it, it depends on different mining companies. Mm. But how much of that change management is a result? The problem of change, change management is a result of thinking about it too late in the cycle. Mm. That if you start with the change management in mind, mm. engaging with the right people mm. very early in the stage. Yes and giving them the ownership, giving, giving them the keys. Yes. Say, you are the operator. I'm not doing this project as a CIO. It's not a technology yep, project. I agree. It's you are the owner because you are mm -hmm. suffering yep. with something. Yep. And you should own this. So rather than starting from this point, they yep. deploy something and say, here's the iPad for you. Yep. You start using it and let me know what, what, yep. you, what you think. Yep. And then when they don't see adoption, they say, oh, we forgot to think about change management. Yeah. Now, let's have another project. Of I'm, change I, I'm management. totally with you on this, Ash. I think too often they go, oh, you know, we're going to do all this, and then oh, now the solutions are in. Now we're going to do change management. I'm yeah. going, no, 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 change management. The first day one you start this project, change management begins. Engage the sites, and whether you call them innovation ambassadors or whatever you do, it's a joint. Pro it has to be joint from the beginning. You know, because the change happens that way. Because you just need. Because my belief is, at the when adoption occurs, it's just a natural, it's just natural that the site, that's just my, this is my solution, I'm off. So versus, oh, now, now we've got to try and force the mine sites to believe it's there and jam it into this, no. So yeah, and I don't think they're there yet on that. That, you know, we've got to begin from day one, so. So the, absolutely. the problem is starts from, from there. The it's problem got, definition, yep. solutioning and everything. Yeah, you've got to get the sites involved because they, they and, but underneath change management, there's ince you know, the incentive programs that mines have. So, you know, there's, like in all, a lot of industries, but, you know, my, I'm, I'm bonused on production and cost <coughs> and new technologies. And I've been doing it this way and I've optimised my operation. So new technologies in their mind are, in a, are a risk. So the danger is if you don't involve the mine operators from the very beginning and you turn up with these, they just see it as a risk. Yeah. And uh, it's a risk to my operation, it's a potential safety risk, and B, it's a bonus risk. Because hmm. if I miss my production targets and my cost targets, my bonus goes away. Correct. <coughs> so incentive schemes need to, so A, you need to involve them first, but then I say incentive schemes need to also reflect That's great. your ability That's to great absorb point. technology. Yes. Yeah. Correct. You have to. Yeah. So Otherwise, why would anybody do that? I wouldn't do it, no. Yeah. You know, That's so. right. Because all it has is the potential to disrupt my business. Exactly. So no one's going to say, Ash, you did a great job adopting that technology, but you're not getting your bonus because you missed your production target. Yeah. Or I'm going to give you, you missed production, you missed cost, but I'm getting you. That doesn't happen. That people, doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, so people know that. that. That's a great point. Yeah. That's a great point. Well, Peter, then, uh, as promised, th that was my last question. Ash, thank you. It that was, was an, an enjoyable discussion. That was really great. <laughs> Covered a lot of ground. <laughs> thank you for uh, sharing your insights, Peter. It is really valuable. Appreciate it. Thank well, you. Th thank you very much.